Hello and welcome to Shepherd Speak here on EWTN. I'm Colm Flynn and today we are coming to you from Edinburgh in the beautiful country of Scotland. And normally on Shepherd Speak, the interviews are recorded indoors, but we are taking advantage of a very rare heat wave here in Scotland. And my guest today is Archbishop Leo Cushley. He is the Archbishop of St. Andrews and Edinburgh. This is very unusual for Scotland, Your Grace, it, isn't it? It certainly is, yes. So we're enjoying every single minute that we possibly can of it. Lovely. We're here in your beautiful uh, backyard in the middle of Edinburgh. Yes. Um, and by the way, I have to say happy birthday. You oh. celebrated a birthday a few oh, days ago. Thank you. That's right. I was 39 again. Yes. Th 39 right. again. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do for the birthday? Um, I worked hard. I saw um, the principal teachers of religious education. Um, we had a long day. We had a spiritual day, some, some recollecting and um, had mass together, nice little lunch. Not much of a birthday as such as a holiday, but it was great fun to get together with them and to, to build to build up our relationships and to talk about the religious education of our children. So it felt like a pretty good way to spend a birthday, really. And of course, every time it's your birthday, it's a cause to go back and be nostalgic and think of the past and your childhood. And yes. that's what we'll do now, if that's okay. okay. Sure. Odinston was where you were born. That's right, yes. Born into a big family? Um, no, I had a brother and a sister, so not especially big. I was the eldest. And um, we had a very happy, quiet, normal childhood. Um, the, the Catholic school was five minutes one way. The, uh, the church was five minutes the other way. And the sweetie shop was five minutes the other way. So we thought we were doing very well yeah. indeed. Yeah. Everything you could need right there on your Absolutely. doorstep. Absolutely, when you're that age, definitely. Yeah. That's it. And yeah. your father had a bakery. That's right, yes. He had a, he was in a, a there was a partnership, um, a, a friend of his brother and they, they started a bakery. My father took over from his, from his brother and they, they made that, that work for the, the rest of my father's life. And um, he worked hard, um, but he was, he was a good man, uh, a, a funny man and, uh, and a, a, a lovely guy. But who wouldn't say that about their dad? About their father. And yeah. your mother was a homemaker. She looked after That's the right. family at home. She did. And growing up, what kind of things, Archbishop, were you interested in? What sparked your interest? Well, I, I was interested in the sciences, actually. I was interested in the planets and astronomy, okay. um, the universe. I was fascinated by that. And I was quite good at science in school. And, um, and, and I ended up being accidentally distracted uh, by, by a friend of mine who invited me to go along on a school trip uh, to, to Rome. And I had no plans to go to Rome. And what age would you have been then? I was 14. And up until then? You know, I was from a regular Catholic family, so I went to, to Mass. Um, the, the priests were good friends of ours. They would come around the house. I would be sent round with half a dozen rolls or some scones or some uh, tea cakes for the, uh, for the priests. So I, we had a very natural, uh, relaxed, friendly relationship with the local clergy. It was a very much a part of our lives. Um, and did you have a strong faith even at a young age or was it something you did out of obligation? You went to Sunday Mass because you had to or...? Yeah, I think it was neither. It was very naturally part of, of our lives, um, very comfortably so. Um, it was neither an obligation nor something where we, 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 we felt we were being channeled into something that was not our own. We, we grew up very happily, calmly as, as, as practicing Catholics. So tell me about that trip to Rome and yes. what it was that you experienced there that started yes. your journey down another path. Another path, that's true. Well, with, with this uh, school group, we, we went to Rome in 1975. And um, I can remember standing in St. Peter's Square um, for, it, there was a special holy year that year. And uh, Paul VI came out, celebrated mass and stood in the balcony, he gave us his blessing. And we were there with 150,000 other Catholics. I don't know how many, but the square was full. It was a wonderful, positive experience. But at the time, I had no particular um, sense of a vocation to the priesthood. But the idea started, I think, from then to grow slowly within me. And as time and luck and providence would have it and God's good grace, 10 years later, I found myself being ordained a priest. Because I've heard you say before that it was something about not only, of course, the beautiful city that you were in, but it was yes. the people that you were surrounded with That's right. and the example that they were showing. That's right, very much so. Um, I, I came away with it and the idea grew in me that here is, here is something I would love to be a greater part of. I would like to be uh, able to contribute to. And it, 
it, it started quietly and it started slowly, but it was real nonetheless. And that, I think, is where it started. And I know it's probably difficult to pinpoint it, but what mm-hmm. was it? What was it about the people that you encountered and the priests? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it felt like this was something good that you could do with your life. And it started like a, like a small voice, a small question to me that I couldn't quite put down, I couldn't quite put away. And I've heard this said by young men and women again and again who have come to me since, asking if they, if they have a vocation or if they should test a vocation to the priesthood or the religious life. And it reflected very much my own personal experience that it starts as a small question and becomes something that you, you have to test, you have to go and try. And when you went back home, you tried to ignore that voice or suppress it and concentrate on astronomy and the sciences? I, I didn't try to suppress it especially. I just thought, where, 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 where does this idea come from? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and yet, gradually, it, it, took, it took greater dominance in my thoughts. And Your Grace, what was it about being in Rome and surrounded by those people that really inspired you? I think it was an experience like none I had ever had before of the celebration of Mass, can you imagine? I'd never been to a Mass with 150,000 other people (laughs) before, but it was such a moving, uh, happy, beautiful moment and a unique moment in my life. And surely that's got to inspire uh, a young person going to such a thing. I've heard you say before that it wasn't just the occasion, but it was the people themselves and the way they were acting and their own joy and happiness that struck you. That's true. That that you 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 are as it were you're you're caught up in their own enthusiasm in the proper use of the word, and and that 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 love and that that passion for our Lord and our faith, and for the mass and being there at the very centre of the church. I think all of those ingredients become something that that a young person takes away with them, and that slowly germinates and grows in their heart until they say, "I would like to be a part of this in a bigger, more important way." So when you came back home to Scotland, did you pursue your wishes of getting into the sciences or astronomy? No. What happened was, uh, after about three months, I went to my mum and dad and I said, look, I've been thinking about this for a while. Um, I'd I'd like to go to seminary and test this vocation. And how did they react? Um, The reaction was, it was fairly balanced. It was, well, you're you're old enough to, to put that question to us. You're old enough to go and test this vocation. And your father having the family business, the bakery, did he not want you to follow in his footsteps and take over there someday? Yes, I think he did. But he never said that at that point. It was only after the fact that he sort of said to me, it would have been nice if and it would have been nice that. But he also told me that he had thought when he was a young man of being a white father, of being a missionary in Africa, and I'd never heard this, and my mother had never heard it either, so it came as a surprise to us. So perhaps there was a part of him was happy to, to acknowledge that and to see that and let it grow. It sounds like it was a pretty easy decision for you to make, to go to seminary. Was there any struggle within you? Um, no, there wasn't. The, the, the hardest part of it actually was uprooting myself to go and do this, because for a year I had to learn what, what to do and what it was like, and. Um, make friends but once I had settled down and I had made good friends the rest of it was it was a great adventure. Was life in the seminary as you expected it to be or was it a surprise? Um, It was I I really didn't know what to expect but I didn't enjoy my first year there because it was all completely different and it was hundreds of miles away from where my family lived and I had to get used to that so I got on the train and went up north in Scotland miles and miles away uh, to this this great big seminary with uh, with a couple of hundred boys in it and and I had it all to learn but as I say once I once I made friends and they're still my friends today and we're all still priests today um, that helped me settle down and really grasp the the question at hand, explore the vocation, find out more about my faith and see if this was what the Lord was calling me to do. And you would have been 14, 15 That's years right. of age at that yes. time. Yes. So what age were you ordained then? 24. 24, what was that like? It was it was memorable, it was wonderful. It was a, it was a Sunday afternoon um, and that meant that it was a bit of a struggle for the priests of my diocese to come because they'd already said lots of masses, but they came along anyway. <laughs> And I remember one of them in particular, whom I'd never met, um, coming up to me 
to say you are very welcome in the priesthood. So it wasn't just symbolic, it was genuinely friendly and moving and made me feel as if I'm, I'm finally arriving at something that, that I want to do, that I, that I feel is right for me. Did you feel that sense of peace then within you and that sense of home? Very much so, very much so. Although I still had to complete some studies. Um, came back after I completed the studies, but I felt welcome among my brother priests in the diocese. You've had a pretty incredible journey since then. Uh, you've traveled all <laughs> over the world. This is something you probably never expected uh, all, yeah. growing up. Tell me a bit about where you went then and yes. how your journey as a priest started to progress. Okay. I was, um, I was half a dozen years uh, working in my diocese, mostly in high schools, as it happens. And uh, one day I got a call to come and see my bishop and he sat me down in front of him and between us there was a, a letter and it had written at the top of it and read the Secretariat of State. And I thought to myself, I've done something so terrible uh -oh. that, that, the, that the Vatican has written this letter about me. And my bishop said, don't worry, Leo, it's a good thing. Uh, they want you to join the diplomatic service. And I, and I paused and I hesitated because it's a question that's posed to you. You're not, no one's making you do it. But if you say yes, your life changes completely. And I was happy in the diocese where I worked and I was happy as a diocesan priest. And that was now, I was now being asked to say yes to a completely different life. Well, as we pause you there in your story where your life is about to change forever, we're going to take a quick break. We're with uh, Archbishop Leo Cushley here in Edinburgh, Scotland. We'll be right back in a few moments here on Shepherd Speak. Welcome back to Shepherd Speak. I'm Colm Flynn and today we're coming to you from Edinburgh in Scotland enjoying this beautiful heat wave they're having and our guest is Archbishop Leo Cushley. He's telling us about his vocational story and at this point you are sitting with your bishop here in Scotland. There's a letter on the desk in front of you asking you to leave the work you're doing in your diocese here That's and right. head to the Vatican to do diplomacy work. Now, That's right. Most people probably don't know, don't know what a uh, diplomat does in the church. Yes. What is the role of a diplomat in the Vatican? Well, the role is, is related to the fact that the, the popes are sovereign international actors. The pope is the sovereign pontiff. And so um, in order to maintain that, there needs to be some kind of structure. That, why should we maintain it? We maintain it because it gives the pope the freedom to say and to act as he needs to in order to teach souls and in order to proclaim the gospel in season and out of season. And it comes from the late medieval period when nation states start to emerge as we understand them today. And diplomacy was a way of the Christian princes keeping in touch with each other, with the center of their world, which was Rome, which was the Holy See. And so naturally there, there was diplomacy, that there was an exchange of ambassadors and opinions and diplomats between all these people. Um, because the life of the church was an essential part of, of Christendom. It, it's, it, it's, it's so obvious to say it, but that is where modern diplomacy really starts. And so the Holy See was part of that very naturally. And in spite of the, the, the disappearance of the papal states and the, 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 the shrinkage, as it were, of any sovereign territory around about the Pope, um, nonetheless, the Holy See still exists as a sovereign international actor. And so they have diplomatic agents and they tend to be, for the most part, diocesan clergy. And did you see this letter in front of you as an immense challenge? Was it something that overwhelmed you or was it something that excited you? Because I suppose Rome was the city that inspired you and you yes. had this offer here to go back to that city yes. and work in the Vatican closely with the yes. church there. Yes, I think I, I treated it as a challenge. I had uh, been a student in Rome, in the Scots College and at the Gregorian and at St Anselmo with the Benedictines. I'd been uh, for eight years in Rome and when in class, especially at the Greg, I had seen the young men training at the Academia, which is the diplomatic college, and I had always been filled with admiration and been impressed by these young men. 
and I had never thought for a minute that I would be asked to join the ranks because I just didn't think I had the, the brains or the wherewithal to do it. And so it was not something I was especially interested in. I never expected this at all. So I was going along in a certain direction and to be asked to join that group of men, I had an idea because I had already studied in Rome what was involved because people think it's all champagne cocktail receptions and living in Paris or Berlin and it's not, it is very different. The Holy See has a diplomatic service scattered among nearly 120 countries um, and representing the, the Holy Father in nearly 180 countries and so you are not going to be normally for the most part in the palaces of this world you're going to be in a very different situation but you're also going to be far away from your family mm. your friends your fellow priests your your bishop the, the bishop in whose diocese you were incarnated and you have to be prepared to give that up you're starting from scratch in a way in a way that's right and where did you find yourself assigned to I started off with a short experience in Egypt um, and after I'd had a look at what the life was like and after they had had a look at me to see if I was any good at it, um, they then sent me to Burundi in Central Africa and I was there for four years. Normally you would do three years in each country that, that's following the, the way that any other diplomatic service works. I can imagine at times like uh, normal diplomatic work it can be quite dangerous. It can be, it depends on the country, of course. Um, but most places um, respect and welcome diplomats and, uh, and they, they get certain small privileges. Um, but uh, most of the time I felt um, safe, I felt happy. I found working in these different countries absolutely fascinating. It, it was, um, as I say, quite unexpected in the great scheme of things, but I, I got accustomed to doing it. And I, and I grew to like it a lot. Even though you can't put down deep roots, you get to know a different country, a different local church every three years. And it was, it was very, very interesting. Did you have to learn how to be a diplomat, as if it were? We have a diplomatic college called the Academia. Okay. And, um, and it's the oldest in the world, as far as we know. And it, uh, it does a very fine job of taking uh, diocesan priests, because we're all diocesans and giving us some, some training. They expect us to do uh, a license in canon law. They expect us to do a doctorate in something. Um, and uh, I had already had a couple of degrees, but I didn't have that particular set of them. So I ended up doing a, a doctorate in canon law. And there are internal courses to help you with languages, especially Italian. They don't care how good your Italian is. You do Italian if you're a non-Italian till the day you leave. Um, and they work on your modern languages, um, French, Spanish, that kind of thing. And I know you ended up then in the United Nations in That's New right. York City, working yes. there at that high level. Yes. Looking back over your diplomatic career, was there anything that struck you or anything stands out in your mind as something you're very proud of achieving um, with the church? I think it was, it was good to be there for a start. I think it's important to be in institutions like that, the multilateral ones, because um, it, 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 gives, it gives the church an opportunity to be at a, a table that otherwise isn't open to, to other influences of, of our kind. And so we are able quietly uh, and kindly, charitably, um, to put the case for our, our anthropology, our view of humanity, our view of the human person. And it's the kind of thing that we all have in common, no matter um, what your faith is. Um, we all have to, at the end of the day, live in, in human bodies, in a human situation. And we have a particular anthropology, a particular view of who we are and why we're here, how we came to be here. And we're able to, to put that among the discussions um, of the nation states as they, as they deliberate and try to find a way forward to promote peace and justice and human rights. And did you find when you were working, let's say, in the United Nations that they would listen to the voice of the Catholic Church and they would uh, take heed and take it seriously? Sometimes. Uh, what happened was that you would go into a room and there could be, say, for example, you're discussing a, a draft uh, decision or a draft resolu resolution. You, would, you could have 30 different countries in that room and you could be friendly with those ones over there and not friendly with those ones over there concerning the thing that's being discussed. So you might be in agreement with them, but not with them. 
But then two hours later, you could be in a discussion about another draft resolution and the mosaic of relationships changes entirely. So you were never always friendly with them and not always friendly with them. It changed every time. And you learned to respect each other, you learned to become friends with each other, and you learned to, to work together. And we were all trying to work for the, the, the betterment of, of humanity in, in the different areas that the UN works in. Um, but we didn't always agree on how to go about that. In 2009, you returned from diplomatic work in South Africa, went back to the Vatican in Rome, yes. and you got to work with Pope Benedict. What was that like? That was a wonderful moment. It was, uh, it was, it was great fun, let me say. Um, lots of hard work kept us working hard, um, but there was a, a great deal to be done. There were trips to be prepared um, from the office that I was working in to the English-speaking world, and so... Um, we were getting ready to visit all sorts of countries, in, including my own, as it happens. And I enjoyed the work immensely. It was work I had already had some experience of in the 1990s, and when I first went back to, to Rome. And, um, and I, I must say, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, and being close to Pope Benedict at, at that time, um, in, the, in the middle of his, of his pontificate, it was a, a great honour, a great privilege. What struck you about the man and his character? Um, he was um, he was a Bavarian gentleman. He was uh, always a gentleman, very correct. He, um, as the sovereign pontiff, he didn't have to stand up for anyone coming into the room, but he did, and he did it with that with a, a lovely German gentility towards people. He was also, although he was one of the most brilliant theologians of the of the twentieth century and the early twenty first century, he. He, he didn't impose himself upon people. He would listen to their arguments and would be able to discuss things with them um, kindly and intelligently, brilliantly. And um, one of the things that I take away from that is when I look again at some of the speeches that he made and the, uh, the, the various interventions that we have in writing from him, um, how, how well they have lasted. And you were there then as well for the changeover to Pope Francis. That's right. When Pope Francis uh, right. took office. What was it like working with him? Pope Francis has uh, he's got a different character. He's he's much more of a Latin. So um, he's got a sense of humour. He likes people. He's he's very easy at ease with people, and um, and makes it very easy to work with him. So when did you leave the diplomatic work in Rome and return to Scotland and why, I suppose? I, I was due to continue as a, as a diplomat and a priest um, until I was 75. That's the way it normally goes. And uh, to my great surprise, um, one day in 2013, after the arrival of Pope Francis in office, um, I had been working with him since he had arrived and uh, that was going fine. And I got a call to go over and see Cardinal Marco Ele, who then spent uh, quite a while telling me what a wonderful diocese um, St Andrews in Edinburgh was. And of course I knew where this was going. And then he said, and so I would like to ask you formally, how would you feel if you were to become the new Archbishop of St Andrews in Edinburgh? And I didn't say yes or no. I said, um, I'll, I'll do what the Holy Father wants me to do. And so he said, in that case, the Holy Father nominates you, the Metropolitan Archbishop St Andrews in Edinburgh. What was that like coming back to Scotland? Coming back, it was, it was a bit of a surprise because I hadn't been keeping my eye on this country. As a diplomat, you don't work in your own country. So and what the kind one of country did you come back to? I, I came back to a country that now had a parliament. I came back to a country that had changed significantly in a political way. Um, I came back to a country that had more Catholics than it did before, um, although it would be nice if a few more of them were practicing their faith. But the, 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 the physiognomy of the Catholic Church had changed significantly. Another thing that had changed was ecumenical relations. We are a lot friendlier um, with the, the local Protestant churches than we were, um, than, than I remembered, or the way I remembered it. Um, and so there is, a, there is a new cordiality with them. So many things have changed in Scotland and even the weather has changed. Yeah, it certainly has. And was that one of the things that really surprised you? As you said, more Catholics, but maybe less devout, uh, less mass attendance as well mm -hmm. on a Sunday. It, it, had, it had been going down for a while, but it seems to have 
to have leveled off for the time being. There are reasons for hope. Um, it's it's not all down the way. Um, we do have uh, another reason for hope is the number of vocations that we have. Um, we have fine, fine young men uh, training for the priesthood. Um, there, there is an upturn um, in many places in other religious vocations, although I would like to see a lot more of that in my diocese and in Scotland too. And this is something that you wrote a pastoral letter about recently, the obligation yes. for Catholics to go to Sunday Mass. And That's right. Were you surprised by the attention it got worldwide? I was surprised. I, I thought it was terribly normal to go to Mass on a Sunday. And what I wanted to do was to encourage people to encourage them in their faith if they're going already. After all, it's being read out at Mass and they're already going to Mass. Mm. But hopefully to reach out to other people who have not been going to Mass or have been going on and off um, and to, to let them see the, 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 the beauty of it and the goodness of it. After all, it's, it's not there idly as an obligation. It's, it's part and parcel of our ancient Catholic tradition. That, that the Sunday Eucharist is at the heart of who we are as Catholic Christians. Well, Archbishop Leo Cushley, it's been a pleasure talking to you here Thank in you. this glorious sunshine Thanks, in Colin. Edinburgh, Scotland. Who would have thought it would in have your back it. garden here? And just before we leave you and Shepherd speak, would you like to leave us with a final thought or a blessing for the millions of people watching all over the world? Yes, I'd be very pleased to do that. May Almighty God bless you and keep you wherever you are. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Archbishop Leo Cushley, thank you so much for joining us in Shepherd Speak on EWTN.